Hi, I'm Michael P. Coleman, Content Director for Brother Be Well, thanking you for checking out this Parents and Caregiver series brought to you by Blue Shield of California's Blue Sky Initiative. Hi, I'm Michael P. Coleman, Content Director for Brother Be Well. Thanks to the support of Blue Shield of California's Blue Sky Initiative, we're discussing today the importance of knowing your family's mental health history. One of our Brother Be Well clinical advisors, Cherie Kreiner, is joining us for today's discussion. Cherie is a registered nurse, she's a former psychiatric nurse, and she's the Vice President of the Capital City Black Nurses Association. Cherie, welcome back to Brother Be Well. You know, I always love to see you. Thank you so much for having me. I always love to be here. Let's get into this. I can't, I, I have been waiting for this conversation literally for days and days and days now, because I don't think many people think about mental health and mental, mental health rather and family history as being correlated. So I can't wait to get into this with you. Most of us get the understanding or the importance rather of knowing your family's health history. You know, does, does cancer run in my family or did mom have a heart attack? But we don't always connect that that notion or concept to mental health history. Talk to us about the importance of knowing your family's mental health history. So it's actually the same level of importance, Michael, of knowing your health history and knowing your mental health history for the same reasons. You want to know things that people have had that may have been passed down or could be passed down to you. Um, you also want to know if people have had something they've dealt with it before. There may have been something um, that could have been done or something to look out for ahead of time. So it is important to know um, and also to decrease the stigma. Sometimes you're having symptoms and you feel alone or no one else has gone through this or you're the black sheep when really, you know, you might be just like your great aunt Ethel that also suffered from bipolar disorder and, um, and how they dealt with it. And then that also may provide a way to talk to your family about it. So it's important to know medically to know what to expect. And it's also important to change the stigma around mental health with your family as well. So important. And we've talked about stigma a lot on this platform. So I appreciate you mentioning that, Cherie. Many of us still think of mental illness as 100% situational. Something must have happened that caused this to be. While that sometimes is the case, we, we now know and understand that mental health isn't often related to situations. It can be as simple as just a brain chemistry issue. So let's debunk that former notion right now. And let me ask you that question, Cherie, directly. How does family history affect mental illness? Right, so I'm gonna give you an example, but also want to remind you, Michael, what mental illness is. It, exactly what you said, it's a chemical imbalance, right? And so if you think about it, what makes those chemicals, your brain, your organs, um, your endocrine system, which are your physical, your biological health, right? So that's where that health piece comes in at, right? If you have an issue or an issue that runs in your family that impacts any of those structures, they may also impact your mental health. Also, there are some mental illnesses that we specifically know are passed down and what age they show up. For instance, with schizophrenia, um, normally the onset is late teens, early 20s, and there is a probability of schizophrenia being passed down from generation to generation. So that's something that you'd wanna know, especially if you're having children and you have a family history of schizophrenia. And then uh, when that age comes for your child, knowing to look out for those types of symptoms, and it may explain away and provide an opportunity to get sooner help for your loved one if you knew that that is something to be on the lookout for and not to mask it as something else because you don't know. So having a health history or a mental health history specifically helps inform you to make those decisions. Some people choose not to have children at all because of their mental health history. So that's something you should know. If you have a family history of schizophrenia and your 
uh, spouse or uh, significant other has that health history as well, and you know you're increasing the probability of that, some people choose not to have children, or they may even choose not to go into that um, relationship. So it's really good information to have so that you can make the best decision for your health, and especially when you're building families. It's such so important, that connection, and really appreciate you sharing that, Cherie. And, and I can't imagine what it's like to have to make those critical decisions, but you're right, without information, you can't make the right decision. So really appreciate you sharing that. I'm wondering about families, not unlike mine, that, that talking about mental health history might not come as easily to some as, as it does to others. How do you ask about the family's mental health history? It's, it's still so dicey and, and in fact taboo in a lot of families to even talk about it. So can you give us any tips for how we begin to talk about and how do we ask the right questions so that we find out those, those mental health histories that we need to know? You know, Michael, sometimes it's the labeling I think that people are scared of when you use the medical terms or when you use the diagnoses and people get concerned about, you know, depression or anxiety or schizophrenia. But, you know, breaking the ice, talking to your most uh, close or your nearest relatives. So, um, you know, mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, and considering both sides, your maternal side and your paternal side. But, you know, have you ever dealt with being really sad and you, you just couldn't shake it? Have you ever dealt with worrying a lot? Uh, what did you do when that happened? So using common language about what you're, what it is that you're actually experiencing to try to talk about that. Another, another big one is postpartum depression. And a lot of women won't talk about it, but a lot of women also experience it. Uh, so having those conversations in plain terms um, and asking if someone has dealt with it or, you know, has anyone in the family ever dealt with this? You know, I feel like I've had this for a long time. I don't really know how to control it. So decreasing the stigma by making it plain, as my grandmother would say, make it plain. Um, but really doing that and just decreasing that stigma by um, approaching those that you can talk to. And then that may lead to other information. Like I said, um, that actually happened to me. We had a family member uh, that had schizophrenia. And I just remember growing up, everyone saying, oh, that's your weird cousin so-and-so. But really, they were dealing with um, a lifetime of mental illness. And I had to put two and two together over the years. And you ostracize people when you don't know, knowing that history may even help you embrace that loved one or think about them in a different way. So um, not just to help yourself, but also how you treat others. It was so um, powerful sharing that story, uh, Cherie. I really appreciate you sharing that. I know a lot of people watching and listening are, are in the same boat, so they're going to be able to use that information that you just shared. Thank you very much. You mentioned schizophrenia, uh, Cherie, as being one of those conditions to which there was a biological link. I'm wondering if there are other mental health conditions where that's true as well. Right. So there's the potential for bipolar disorder, other mood disorders, as well as there's actually some new science in the realm of epigenetics that looks at essentially even passing down stress through your DNA to the next generation. So all health history and mental health history is really important because it does inform what you could be on the lookout for or what you may even want to work on um, treating. I'm, I'll give you a physical health um, example, like having high cholesterol. If you know that's something that runs in your family, then you tend to have a more plant-based diet, decrease your animal product intake to decrease that level to maybe prevent some of the peripheral vascular problems your mom or your grandmother had. So same thing. If you know that someone in your family suffers from mood disorders, then you may want to consider um, therapy, psychotherapy, uh, having other mental health professionals in your life so that if those changes occur for you, that you have a better chance of intervening earlier and often so that you have a better quality of life. I really appreciate you giving that information as well. It, it's so, so critical that we ask these questions and we learn these histories. As we're talking to families, Cherie, I'm wondering about how broad we cast that net within our family. Should we just be talking about uh, first degree relatives, mother, father, siblings, children, or do we need to broaden it to uncle and aunt? You mentioned 
uh, Ann Esther, or, or I, I forget the name that you attributed to the mm -hmm. Ann earlier in the show, but should we be talking more broadly than just our, our very close nuclear family when we're asking questions about mental health history? Absolutely. Um, get as much history as you can, because that's how you can find sometimes that needle in a haystack. It may not have been your mother or father or their mother or father, um, but as I mentioned, it could be a cousin, it could be an aunt, um, it could be an uncle or someone that had something that may give a clue as to what you're dealing with. So the more, the better. Of course, the nuclear family has the most influence, but you cannot count out those other relatives. You, a, a lot of us, as we talk about that, that biological link to relatives as it relates to mental health, we're, we're really, it gets me, leads me rather to think about nature versus nurture. We don't often use that uh, terminology to talk about behavioral health, but I happen to think we should. We know, for example, that alcoholism is only 50% genetic. That would leave the other 50% to be influenced by environmental factors. We know alcoholism is often learned behavior. Many of us have watched family members, as we think about alcohol, you know, self-medicate. And without knowing it, we've learned how to, to do that. Uh, you're our, our health professional today, Cherie. So I want to just ask you the direct question. How much of mental health, if you can, can put a number on it, how much of it exactly is nature versus nurture? Um, you know, I'm going to tell you that it depends. <laughs> um, it depends on the type of mental illness and what's going on. But what I will say is, um, where nature, our biology, so that chemical imbalance or the inability of our organs to function um, in a way that they should, is really only a component because without knowing that information, then you're absolutely right. The environment influences us. We, we talk often about the social determinants of health um, and how that comes into play. That's a perfect example of all of those factors coming in to influence the severity of how someone may experience mental illness. So the nurture part is just as significant as the nature, if not more, considering the circumstance. Wow, that, that's, um, I think a lot of people are gonna be surprised to hear that, Cherie, so really appreciate you breaking it down for us. As we talk about biological links, I can't let you get away without talking about um, people that might not have easy access to that biological information. I'm thinking about adoptees and, and communities of color have been uh, unofficially raising children, adopting children, if you will, for, for centuries now. So what would you have to say to people that don't have direct access to information from their biological family's mental health history? What, what advice might you have for them? Well, here's the good news. This is where preventative care and doing routine uh, appointments with your health care provider really come in handy. I've talked to you, Michael, multiple times about this, making sure that you're seeing your regular health care provider annually, making sure that you're seeing um, a mental health care provider. It's not just for when things are going bad or you may be feeling off, but having, you know, understanding those uh, positive coping mechanisms that we all deal with things that are less than pleasant. So it's okay to make that um, connection, as well as knowing yourself, listening to yourself. You're an expert on how you feel and what's going on. So noticing when something is not right or has changed and continues to worsen. So not only that it came on, but it's continuing to worsen, uh, to worsen or not get better. So definitely advocating for yourself, doing all of your preventative um, health care, getting your exams, and staying ahead of the game, especially when you're you know, essentially, you know, living without the manual, right? You don't have that history to look back to, uh, to look back to, um, then you can definitely um, make sure that to stay on top of the prevention stuff. I would also say that some folks now, it's very popular, Michael, to get your DNA tested. They have all types of uh, brands, of DNA testing, some that look for uh, biological uh, issues, some that actually find uh, familial matches that may have also gotten their DNA done and that may lend some information where um, like if you're adopted and you don't have your birth parents information but maybe someone that shares your DNA has also done a DNA test and may give you insight so that's been very popular uh, as well. 
Sheree, it never fails. Whenever we talk, you surprise me. And you, I hadn't even thought of DNA testing as being a way that an adoptee could find out a little bit more about their history than, than they may know. So that's a great, great suggestion. Thank you. No problem. Have we missed anything mm -hmm. at all as it relates to this topic? Or have we got it covered? You've been a lot of uh, wealth of resource, wealth of knowledge, as you always are, Sharice. So I don't want to let you get away before I ask that question. Nope. I just want to make sure to remind everyone to listen to your body, listen to your mind, um, get as much information and be as prepared as you can to have the healthiest life you can live. And you know what? Before I let you go, something else I wanted to ask you about when you were talking about doing your due diligence and those annual exams and seeing your, your medical provider on a regular basis in a way that is building a history, even for an adoptee that doesn't have one, you, you can start where you are. And if, if you're 25 and you've always done that, that's 25 years of history that then can be transferred to the next generation. Is that a good way to think about it? Absolutely. You are writing those pages in your own book and that's the way to go. I am so happy I've spent uh, so much time with you, Sharice. I'm, I'm learning every day and coming up with some decent connections. Really appreciate you. Sharice Kreiner, registered nurse, uh, uh, vice president of the Capital City Black Nurses Association and good friend of mine. Thank you, Sharice, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for having me. See you next time. You take care. And I want to thank also our sponsor for this parent and caregiver series, Blue Shield of California, and specifically their Blue Sky Initiative. That initiative boosts access to mental health support. You can learn all about their fantastic program at bluesky.blueshieldca.com. That's bluesky.blueshieldca.com. Another website that I'll tell you about quickly, our own, brotherbewell.com. We are here to support boys and men of color, African-American, Latinx, na Native and Indigenous or Asian and Pacific Islander, and the LGBTQIA plus brothers that inform and enhance all of those culture communities. Brother Be Well is here for everyone within those groups. And if you like this video, there are others just like it, audio podcasts, print pieces, links to resources, all kinds of information designed to help you be well. Check it all out at brotherbewell.com. My name again, Michael P. Coleman. I'm content director for Brother Be Well. I'll ask you quickly to do two things for me. Won't take a lot of time. Take great care of yourself and then reach out. Take great care of somebody else if you would. I appreciate it. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. God bless. Thank you.